Greetings. Uh, welcome to the Bartlett Woods a Church of Christ online Bible class. We've been studying Exodus and we're so glad that you uh, have joined us today. Uh, yes, last week we looked at Exodus chapter 33 where uh, Moses was interceding for the Israelites after they had bowed down a maid and bowed down to a golden calf. Uh, Exodus 33 also reveals to us that Moses had a tent of meeting where he would meet with God and he would inquire uh, questions and for answers for the people of the Israelites. And also we see in chapter 33 that Moses was asking to see God's glory. Well, today, chapter 34, uh, Lord willing, will cover Moses continues to try to work on the relationship between God and his people and that he receives a, a second a set of Ten Commandments, uh, same as the original, but he broke the previous ones. And then we see the effects of Moses after he has, uh, effects on Moses after he has the uh, special encounter with God. So be turning your Bibles to Exodus chapter 34. Uh, before we go any further, let's go to God in prayer. Uh, Father, we're so thankful for you and and for the blessing that you are to us, Father, thank you for all the things that you do uh, to us, for us. You are a, a great God. You are powerful and wonderful. I pray, Father, that you'll bless this study today. Uh, help us, Father, as we look at it. I pray that you'll give us insight and wisdom. Help us to know, Father, uh, what we need to know about you and about how you deal with your people. Thank you, Father, for this record. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for the hope uh, that you give to us. And Father, please bless this study and please bless these people that are with us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, let's look at uh, chapter 34, verses 1 through 3. So the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up to Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So here we are again. The Lord told Moses to chisel out uh, some more stone tablets, and he says, I will write on them. He says, these tablets are the, the tablets that you broke, and I need to replace them. So... He told him to be ready in the morning, he says, and come up here to Mount Sinai. Now, if uh, my calculations are correct, this is about the eighth time that Moses has gone up and down Mount Sinai. So, um, it's, uh, it's hard enough to climb a mountain. He's supposed to be climbing it with some tablets in his hand, some stone tablets. I bet they were heavy. God says, nobody else on that mountain uh, I guess he didn't want Aaron up there since Aaron had led these people in, in this sin. That he says, I want to keep your flocks and herds away too. Nobody, nothing on the mountain. It's just going to be uh, uh, you and uh, me, Moses. So that's uh, the way it would start out. In verses 4 through 7, we find, So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. So Moses did as he was told. He chiseled out the tablets and early in the morning he was heading uh, back up uh, the mountain uh, to meet the Lord. So find in, we find in verse 5 that the Lord came down, came met him there at the top of the mountain, and there the Lord proclaimed his name, the Lord, which is, Yahweh. And uh, remember, uh, way back there in Exodus chapter 3, maybe many months uh, before this incident, and Moses was on Mount Horeb, and he saw the burning bush, and he had no idea what was going on. And he said, who are you? And he said, I am. 
the, the Lord said, I'm Yahweh. Well, once again, this is, this is emphasized. I'm Yahweh. When, when Moses asked to see the glory of the Lord, to, to, to know more about him, uh, the Lord is reminding him that he's Yahweh, and he's telling him more uh, about himself. That Mount Horeb, which was known as the mountain of God, it's the same place. Moses and God are at the same place that they were at uh, months before when the burning bush and the same mountain that Moses had been going up and down, visiting with God and, and getting the Ten Commandments, and, and now a second time. Also in verse 6 there, you see that the, the Lord passed in front of Moses and proclaimed or revealed who he was. Um, Moses is realizing his request now that he wanted to see the Lord's glory. And the Lord says, well, you know, I'll, I'll pass by, but you'll not see my face. I'll, I'll see you as I, as I pass by. And it was here that, that God reveals to Moses that he has compassion. He cares for Moses and his people, that he's gracious, that he shares his blessings uh, with the people even when they don't deserve it, that he is, in fact, slow to anger, that he, that he can be patient with them, that he's abounding in love. He has so much love uh, for them and that he's faithful. He's the truth. And so he reveals himself to Moses and, and uh, who he is. He reveals his character to him. And you know, this particular uh, definition or, or revelation of God is referred to numerous times in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament that he has these, these qualities of compassion and, and graciousness and, and slow to anger and abounding in love and, and that he's faithful. It's a very important thing for, for us to remember too. And he goes on to say in verse 7 that he loves thousands. Some scholars think that, that this, this means a generation, that it just keeps going on and going on, and that he forgives their sins. He's, he's been asked several times by Moses, will you forgive us? And God's saying, yes, I forgive people their sins. That's who I am. And he says, but the guilty will be punished. If you don't repent, if you don't change, if you don't turn to me, you'll be punished. And even to the third and fourth generation, he says, and, and this is a, a more likely to mean that sin, um, that the effects of sin, that the repercussions of sin affects generation after generation. It affects so many people in so many different ways. The cost of sin uh, continues and be hard on the family. The influence of the sin, the shame of a sin, and so uh, most scholars believe that this is what this is talking about, when, and, and from generation to generation. Now, verses eight and nine, we see after seeing this and hearing this, Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worshipped, and he says in verse nine, "O Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes," he said, "then let the Lord go with us, although this is a stiff-necked people." Forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. So Moses got what he asked for and he's just overwhelmed. He immediately bows down and begins to worship God in awe and respect and, and wonder and amazement. And again, he asks. This is like the third time in this, this short little time since they uh, the Israelites had, had made the graven calf and, and bowed down to it. Lord, uh, Moses asked again, Lord, please go with us. We need you to go with us. Will you uh, forgive us? He says, take us as your inheritance or uh, take us as your own possession, that special relationship that we have with you. And then 10 through 14. Then the Lord said, I'm making a covenant with you. He's reassuring him. I'm making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going or they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Uh, do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So God is giving him assurance 
I'm, I'm making a covenant. I've got this agreement. I'm, I keep my covenant. I keep my agreements. Uh, and so he says, I'm making this covenant. It's, it's uh, uh, another one just like the first one. And he says, I'm going to do wonders. I'm going to do miracles like never before. All we'll see. And you can imagine some of those things that were yet to come that Moses didn't know about. Uh, Joshua led the people uh, around Jericho and the walls fell down just by them walking around and blowing their trumpets and shouting. So there are many other things that God was going to do that all peoples would know and, and hear about how God loved them. Uh, he's an awesome God, and, and Yahweh, the Lord, says, I'm going to do this uh, for you. And, but he says in verse 11, Obey, obey me. I'm going to drive out all these in, inhabitants. I'm going to drive out the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzi, uh, uh, Perizzites and the Hivites. And I'm going to drive out all of these people. He says, don't make any treaties with them. I've got a covenant with you. You've got a covenant with me. That's all we need. I don't want you making covenants with these people or they're going to be a snare to you. They're going to lead you away from me. I want you, in verse 13, I want you to break down their objects of worship. I want you to tear down their Asherah poles. Now, you're going to read in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, time and time again, these Asherah poles are going to come up. Uh, Asherah was the wife of El, uh, a Canaanite god. She was the, uh, the fertility uh, goddess. And so meant there's a lot of sexual immorality, uh, immorality there involved in, in, in that worship to her. And uh, apparently they would, uh, these Canaanites would, uh, would fashion poles or fashion trees to, and to, to look like her, and, and they, they worship there in, in their own ungodly, licentious way. And so um, the, the Israelites over the years have to deal with this a whole lot, and God says don't have anything to do with them. If you remember Gideon and uh, in, in Judges, we find that Gideon tore down uh, the Asherah pole. So long history there about this uh, this ugly goddess. So verse 14, God says, do not worship any other God. You gotta think in the back like, like, well, you know, like you just got there doing, don't worship any other God. He says the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord's name is jealous. And I've always thought this was, was uh, very interesting uh, because, you know, we're not supposed to be jealous, but God is jealous. It's a righteous jealous. That uh, Hebrew word is kanal. Can you say that with me? Kanal, okay. And so that word jealous is, is, is God is a righteous jealous because our relationship with God is like a husband with a wife. And, and there's, there's a covenant been made there. And, and there should be faithfulness. There should be loyalty. There should be purity there. There should be a, 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 a decision there and a commitment to stay true and holy and faithful to them. And that's what God is saying. I don't want to put up with any unfaithfulness with you. It's a, it is a righteous jealousy. Uh, verses 15 through 16, we find uh, God saying, continue to say, be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land, for when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons and those daughters prost prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons and do the same. So God is just reiterating here, do not be making uh, treaties with them. These people are going to prostitute themselves uh, to, to their gods. They're going to lead you away. And I do not want this. This is spiritual adultery here. And I do not want you being unfaithful to me. I don't want you sacrificing or eating the sacrifices to their gods. And he says and, and, uh, there's going to be these temptations to, to marry the people of the land. Don't do it. They will lead you astray. Uh, do you remember Paul saying that evil companions corrupt good morals? And so uh, God wants us to stay separate. Uh, God wants them to stay separate from these false gods and from, from these people that, that would worship uh, false God. Don't be making treaties with them. Don't be marrying them. Just leave them alone. Stay away. So you got to ask yourself a question. Does it matter what you believe? 
Uh, is it all dogs do get to go to heaven? Well, how does Yahweh feel about, about it doesn't matter what you believe, we just all end up going to the same place. You believe what you want to believe, and I believe what I want to believe, and we'll all end up at the same place. I, I think it's pretty plain right here that God says, I don't want you having anything to do with these other religions. I don't want you having anything to do with worshiping these false gods. I'm a jealous God, and I want you to be true and faithful to me, or you will be punished. Verse 17 here, we, we've already, we're in the, 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 I've already begun this topic of uh, the commands that, that God uh, told them to, to abide by, to follow uh, at the giving of the, the, first of the, uh, the first time of the Ten Commandments. And so he's relisting re some items uh, from uh, that first time, and he seems to reemphasize some of those items that uh, the Israelites uh, just happened to break, that broke the covenant. In verse 17, we find, do not make cast idols. Don't make any, any graven images. Remember that one? Well, this word is a different word. And so this may indicate what they had done. Uh, the NASV says, don't make any molten gods. And so God is uh, being very specific here. He, he, you know, if, if they did, in fact, pour that, that gold into a form and and, and fashion it from pouring it, melting it, and pouring it, then God is saying, don't make it, don't, don't you make any molten gods. Whether you're thinking it's me or anybody else, do not be doing that. I think that's, uh, that's something that's, that's very noteworthy. In verse 18, he says, celebrate the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time, in the month of Abib. For in that month, you came out of Egypt. So here they're, they're told to continue to remember the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's this covenant too. We're, 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 we're back to some of the same things. And so that's the Passover, the, the, the feast that would commemorate them uh, getting out of Egypt after all of those years of slavery. And they were not to, that night, they were not to make any bread uh, with yeast in it because it was to indicate they were in a hurry uh, to get out of that land. Verses uh, 19 and 20 also, we see that the first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from herd or flock. Redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamb, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem all your firstborn sons. No one is to appear before me empty-handed so the first of everything is to be dedicated to Yahweh he's a preeminent he's he's to come first and so the first of everything that you have is to be dedicated to him you know it takes a lot of faith for a, a person to do that and so God is saying I'm supposed to get the first now if it's a firstborn donkey he said a donkey is unclean he said, I want you to redeem that with a lamb, or if you don't do that, then go ahead and break its neck. Isn't that, uh, that's kind of uh, amazing right there, isn't it? And he says, the firstborn son is to be dedicated to me. Now, that may be uh, that, uh, that they dedicate this son to, to serve uh, in some way, a special way to the Lord, or, or they could also redeem it, uh, redeem that son, that firstborn son, with with money. So he finishes up and he says, no one is to come to me empty handed. It says, everyone should have something uh, to give to me. Then verse 21, six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest, even during the plowing season and harvest season and harvest you must rest. So he says, I, I still want you to observe the Sabbath. You, six days you're working, but on the seventh day, I want you to rest. Remember, he talked about how uh, on the seventh day that he rested, uh, and so there are other reasons. And so he says, I want you to continue to remember this. This is a day in which you rest. He said, I don't want you plowing on that day, even if it's plow season. And I don't want you harvesting on that day, even if it's harvest season. I, I still remember my grandfather uh, ran a small farm up in northeast Arkansas, and he would not. He's under the new covenant. But he would not plow on uh, the Lord's day, right? he, on the Sunday for him. 
and he would not harvest on the Lord's Day. That's Sunday. That's the first day of the week. But he wasn't going to do it. He, he felt strongly about that. Uh, verses 22 through 24. Celebrate the Feast of Weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory, and no one will covet your land. When you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord, your God. So he says, uh, there's three of these feasts that I want you to observe. I want you uh, to observe that, that Passover feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I want you, uh, here he says, I want you to observe the Feast of Weeks, which was also known as Pentecost. That's the one that's more... Uh, term that's more familiar to us that that feast of weeks uh, in, infers the the seven weeks that would pass after the Passover and it was also the time of the wheat harvest. He says, I want you to celebrate that. I want you to remember that, and I want you to remember the feast of ingathering, or it's also known as the feast of tabernacles, and that's that's at the end of, of the agricultural year. So. It says, all males, everyone are supposed to observe this. Come before the Sovereign Lord and uh, attend these feasts. And uh, all males were commanded to participate there in verse 23. And he goes on to explain, God does, that I'm going to drive out uh, the people of the land. I'm going to enlarge your borders. And he says, don't be worried about what's going to happen when you're at the feast. No one's going to covet, or it seems to, uh, to go more than just want your land. It seems that they're going to try to take your land. Uh, no one's going to do this while I'm away. You know, these feasts could be uh, where they, wherever they might be living. Uh, to, to get to the feast, it might be some distance away, which takes time. And also, some of these feasts lasted several days. And so he said, while you're gone, uh, no one's going to no uh, take any of your land. Verse 25 do not offer the blood of sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. And do not let any of the sacrifice from the Passover feast remain until morning. He's continuing to give these directions on what he wants and what he doesn't want. God's very clear about that. And we need to be clear in following any directions that he gives to us. We need to be clear in doing what he wants and not doing what he does not want. And he says so. So don't be uh, giving uh, giving any uh, bread that has leaven in it when you offer the sacrifice. This goes all the way back to the Exodus. And he says, I don't want that. Don't do that. And he says, uh, if there's any leftovers, anything left over at, this, uh, at the Passover, he says, I do not want you to save it. Uh, get rid of it. Uh, nothing is to remain until morning. And then verse 26 he says, bring the best of the first fruits of your soul to the house of the Lord your God. So it not only includes uh, your animals, or your, your sons, but also include your fruits, what comes from the soil. Um, and then in verse, uh, the last part of 26, he says, once again, it's kind of, uh, we have no idea. And, we, you know, just thinking about it, we have no idea. Thinking, well, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. He says this over and over. He says, don't do this. And the best we can figure out is, is uh, many have said that's just cruel to cook a young goat in its mother's milk. And others uh, that I read says that this is uh, part of pagan rituals. And God says, I don't want you to have anything to do with any uh, pagan rituals. 27 through 28, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there uh, with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So God, here we see God told Moses to write these words down on this tablet. And then we're, it's revealed to us that Moses was there 40 days and 40 nights with uh, no uh, food or nothing to drink. You know, you got to ask yourself, there's always a reason why God puts something in His Word. There's a reason why Exodus is in the Old Testament, and we should be studying. There's a reason why uh, we're told Moses was once again on the mountain for 40 days 
and 40 nights, and he had no food and no water. And many of the scholars think it mentions the no food and no water that Moses is showing penance. He's, he's repenting for the sins of uh, the Israelites there. And so uh, it, it says here that Moses wrote on the tablets. Uh, there's quite a bit of debate on who actually wrote on the tablets among scholars. Did God do this or was it Moses? And you remember back in verse 1 that we started, we looked at verse 1 of chapter 34, the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. God says, I'm going to write on them. And then and here we see that uh, what we just read in 28 and 29 that, that Moses wrote on them. And uh, De Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 4 uh, is Moses recounting what had happened uh, to the Israelites uh, during uh, the Mount Sinai and the wanderings and things. In chapter 10 verse 4 of Deuteronomy we find the Lord, this is Moses writing, uh, uh, writing this saying this, the Lord wrote on these tablets what he had written before the Ten Commandments he had proclaimed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. So there seems to be uh, trying to figure out and uh, what who exactly wrote. And some of the scholars now think that this he, when it says uh, in the latter part of verse 28, and he wrote on the tablets, that that he actually goes back to God, that, that that should refer to God. And that's quite a possibility. There is another possibility. Uh, you may be seeing this in writings and hear this in sermons and teaching this a little bit of confusion. Who wrote who wrote this and who did this? It may be that God actually wrote the Ten Commandment part and Moses uh, was commissioned to write these other things like don't boil a a goat in its mother's milk and remember the Sabbath and the feast that you uh, need to follow. So, uh, kind of something to, to think about. Uh, verses 29 and 332, this begins a very interesting uh, situation between God and Moses and the people. Okay, verses 29 through 32. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. So Moses comes down the mountain uh, with these tablets that he and God had written, I'm going to say, and Moses' face was radiant. And he had no idea uh, what his face looked like. And so from verse 30, the, the Israelites must have been scared. Aaron must have been scared, and some of the other Israelites must have been very scared because they wouldn't come to him. Uh, I got a dog a lot like that. Uh, they, when, when these uh, Israelites saw Moses' face, I got this dog, when he gets into something, he tears my books up or he gets my socks and drags them out of the house or, or whatever, he eats something he's not supposed to eat. He sees his look on my face and he won't come to me. <laughs> I've got to chase him down. I've got to uh, make him sit down <laughs> before I can get a hold of him. And so here's Aaron and some of the Israelites and they see his face, Moses' face, and they're like, no! I even wonder if they didn't run away. In verse 31, it says they came back to him. So I got to wonder if they didn't run away like, whoop, 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 I'm getting out of here. Something's going on. But uh, they were uh, very, very disturbed, and Moses called to them, and, and they eventually came back, and it says all the Israelites came back, and Moses gave them the command, what the Lord had told him on Mount Sinai. And he, so he lets them know again. And this time, you don't hear any, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. They might have. The scripture might not have revealed to us. Remember when the first time, oh, they were going to do this, and they were all behind it, and all this kind of thing. Well, uh, the scripture is silent this time about uh, the agreement that God was supposed to have with the, uh, with the Israelites. I think that's uh, amazing right there. 
In verses 33 to 35, when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. So uh, Moses uh, got, him, got himself a veil and he would put that over his face. Now the Israelites were very aware that Moses had been with God and, and this maybe this was something God wanted them to be aware of is Moses is speaking for me. Uh, look at his countenance. Look at his face. He has been with me and what he says is what I want you to know. So Moses got himself a veil and he uh, would take it off when he went in to talk to the Lord. Uh, this, this where he went to talk was probably the tent of meeting. Remember that was originally set up uh, for Moses to meet with God. Moses would go in and the cloud would settle down uh, over the tent. Joshua was there to protect it. But uh, God uh, gives uh, Moses uh, the message that he wants uh, all the people to know and the people would see this and after Moses would give them the message, he would put the veil back over his face. An amazing, amazing account here of God and Moses and dealing uh, with uh, the people. Now, there's something interesting about uh, verses 33 through 35. Uh, was, it, uh, was this uh, thing on Moses' face, his countenance, was it a radiance or was it horns? Mm, now think about this for just a second. Have you ever seen uh, uh, an early, uh, like a medieval, a picture of Moses with horns? Maybe you've seen a statue or, or a painting, and it's odd if you see this man that's got uh, uh, Bible clothes on. He's got a long beard. He's got tablets in his hands, but he's got horns coming out of his head. There's a reason for that. The Hebrew word for radiant and horns uh, that word, those two words are very closely related. And when the Latin Vulgate translated horns, uh, when, when translated this word, he, the Latin Vulgate used horns instead of radiance. And so during that, uh, that time, that medieval art time, uh, that they would portray Moses with horns on his head instead, instead of a radiant face. Uh, very interesting. Well, you know, Paul says something, or he refers to this uh, very incident and when he writes to the church at Corinth. This happens over and over that, that what happened to the Israelites and what happened to Moses, Paul used quite often uh, to teach lessons. And so in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 7 through 18, Paul would write, Now if this ministry, the ministry they have of taking the new covenant to, to the world, now if this ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be, get, be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory, now in comparison with the surpassing glory. But if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? So Paul is contrasting the new covenant with the old covenant. And when Moses looked and had that, that time with God, his face was glowing. Uh, Moses, Moses was nothing. His, his glory was nothing compared to this new glory uh, with uh, the new covenant, is what Paul is saying. Verse 12, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while their radiance was fading away, but their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who are with all unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness 
with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So Paul is saying we are becoming more and more glorious because we are becoming more and more like Christ. And he says even today when the, when the, the Jews read the Old Testament, when they read from Moses, their veil is on their heart because they can't understand uh, who the Lord is. But when they do, when they release that veil, they come to understand, they can, they can receive uh, and understand that glory too. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with all with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory. Very uh, important passage for us to consider today that, that goes right along with what we've been studying in the Old Testament. Well, may God bless the study of His Word. Thanks for joining us today. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be... Well, Lord willing, we'll be looking at chapter 35, and this is the preparations uh, for the tabernacle. The, uh, the Israelites are just about ready to, to move on from uh, Mount Sinai. God bless you, and hope to see you next week.